I am joined by the Terry Cruz. Sir, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Mike. Good to be here, man. Well, you know, uh, we, we posted on uh, Instagram, hey, send your questions for, uh, for Terry Cruz. We had quite a few uh, responses. But before we get to those in, in the book, uh, Terry, you've lived one hell of a life, man. Um, I mean, you, you faced challenges growing up. Um, and then, you, you know, can we talk briefly about your childhood in Flint, Michigan, and how that shaped the foundation for you to step into all these di- different industries and be a, a, a top performer? You know, I'm, I'm going to hit this real fast because it's, um, you know, I, 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 it's a long story, but I'm going to try to be succinct, man. Um, growing up in Flint at the time when I was a kid, you know, Flint was the, it was Palo Alto. It was the, you know, General Motors was the number one corporation in the world. Uh, people were making lots of money. People were, were getting homes and cars and life was really, really good. And then it stopped. And when I say stopped, it was like a, a break was hit on the freeway. We were going 60, 70 miles an hour. And all of a sudden it was we were spinning out. Um, you know, the gas crisis started in the 80s and I was born in 68. So right around my t- the time I was 11, 12 years old, start, stuff started to change. I mean, when I was growing up, there used to be like smoke pillars all over the city. And what was happening is uh, the factories and people were burning foreign cars. Uh, it was intense. Uh, a lot of people don't remember this stuff, but I grew up with it. Uh, if you had the nerve to bring a Toyota into the city limits, it would get burnt um, and people be standing around it and throwing throwing books on and throwing fire, throwing fuel to the fire uh, in effigy to because they were like foreign cars that never make it over here. And, and then people were really angry about, all, you know, the factories started to close. And what was happening is they went straight from the factory. A lot of people went from factory into drugs. Uh, because that was also the same time as the crack epidemic. You know, a lot of people know about opioids, but in the 80s, the crack epidemic was, it was horrifying, man. And the city basically turned, it was like the walking dead. Um, You know, friends that I knew were immediately hooked on drugs and, you know, strung out and people were unemployed and people were leaving and it was, it was flight and, Whole neighborhoods were gutted. I was in this thing like, oh my God, how do I survive? You know, and there I am about 12 years old, like how the hell am I gonna make it? So it's the thing I knew I had to get out. The whole plan was like, man, get out of here because it's getting crazy. I mean, you gotta understand like every Friday night there was, you know, Flint was the murder capital of the US per capita. You're kidding me. For years per capita, mind you. you know, people were getting shot at every event and it was just bloody and ridiculous. And then on top of that, on top of what was going on outside, inside my house, my father was beating my mother, knocking her out. He was an intense alcoholic. My mother was addicted to religion and it created this really, really toxic mix, man. And I was just like, I, I gotta get out of here, but how? And the question became, how was I going to escape? And so, you know, one thing that influenced me more than anything, because I I always had an art talent. I was draw, I'm left-handed, right-brained, and I used to draw all the time, but it was because my mother wouldn't allow me to do anything else. Uh, She was extremely religious. We're not allowed to play sports, not allowed to go to the movies, not allowed to do anything. So I was, my imagination was everything I had. So I would draw like crazy. And, uh, you know, my imagination just was like, man, one day I'm going to be able to use this stuff. But I never thought anybody would pay me to paint. You know, I mean, it's one of the things because the art world was a very, you know, it it wasn't African-American. You know, I mean, it was it wasn't black people in a lot of that stuff. So I was like, man, I I can't see me getting any money from it. But I knew sports was going to be the way. So. At 14 years old, I started lifting. I started working. I started to, I said, man, I'm going to make it out of here on a football scholarship. I knew football could be my way out. Now, but mind you, I didn't really like football that much. I'll be real honest, man. It was just a, a way to get out. You know, it was like, hey, man, wh- which way is that train running? Okay, I'm running on that train because that train is getting out of here. 
And I ended up getting a scholar. I, I walked on to Western Michigan University and got a scholarship eventually in the second year that I was there. Um, and it ended up being in the NFL for seven years. But let me tell you, what was so crazy is that, you know, this this drive, this whole thing about, man, it, it, it was like leaving a burning building. You know what I mean? And I had to just do whatever I had to do to make it. And it didn't matter what it was. And um, that's a little bit of my mentality growing up because it was a panic. So if I understand, is it sort of a correct assumption that the arts are your passion and football was just the means to get there? Yeah, exactly. And let me tell you, what was crazy, though, is that I didn't believe in myself in that because I just uh, it, it was wild because I, I knew I had a talent. But I had one teacher who truly, truly believed in me, this guy named Mr. Eichelberg, and he filled out all the applications and did everything for me to get a scholarship to, first of all, it was Interlocking Arts Academy, which was this amazing school where, you know, Larry Page, who was the founder of Google, was went to Interlocking. OK, so I'm trying to tell yes. you, it was the, 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 the best people in the world went to Interlocking. All right. And there I was, this little black kid from Flint, Michigan, one of the few black people in the whole place. And I was like, oh, my God, like. I had never been in a world that was, my world was all black and it was all kind of hood and the whole thing. And to be exposed to this kind of thing, it, it opened my eyes in, in, in a lot of ways. And what was wild is that uh, the thing that changed for me is once I got into Interlocking through the scholarship, there they had, it was a big on competition. So they had us put all these drawings and paintings up on a wall and they, they wouldn't let us sign them. And they had this guy from this Art Institute of Cincinnati. He was like this curator. And he came by and he was like, which one is the best, which is the best drawing in this, in this room, on this wall? And he went straight over to mine. He said, this one. And then we were only allowed to put two on the wall. And he said, so what's the second best? And he went all the way across the other room and said, that one. And that's when I knew. I said, wait a minute. I'm good enough to compete and be here with the best in the world. And it blew my mind. It opened my mind to a whole new world that I knew that I hadn't even exposed. You know, it's, it's almost like you you have to be shown the way. You, if, even if you don't, if you just see a forest, you just go, there's no way. But once you get a path in that forest, you start to go, oh wait, there are people who walked here. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. I just found this little area here. And I'm like, and I just decided to do it. And I'm gonna tell you, man, you know, I heard this phrase that I, I really want to apply to me. And uh, it was it was about it was like, don't try to be the best. Try to be the only. And that really hit me like I want to be the only I want to be the only Terry Crews that will ever exist on the face of this earth. And you'll never, ever have a person like me. And that became it, it's like my mantra. It's like my my. It, it, what fuels me and, and competition doesn't. Uh, I realized that to me, I, over all these competitive fields, be it football, sp pro sports, uh, from Hollywood, all this stuff, is that competition, I find, was always, it became the opposite of creativity. You know, and it, it really, that's when I decided I need to just try things that no one else is trying. You know what I mean? And and risk it. And, and the phrase I like to use is called being unembarrassable. Because um, a lot of times you do things because you, you, you won't do things because you're afraid of what people will say. And I, I had to question that. And I remember feeling like, eh, you know, if I get up here and do this, everybody's going to laugh at me or people are going to feel like, oh, what is he doing? And then I challenged it. I was like, you know what, Terry, that's holding you back. So go ahead and do it. And I remember doing things and people would laugh and I would go, okay, no problem. I'm still alive. You know, I, I, I do things people say, no, you suck. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, I do. But what that didn't change my outcome. And I said, but for me to actually get something, you always have to break through that. And so I decided to just try everything I wanted to do, everything. And I mean, everything. Like, 
when I started out in Hollywood, the whole thing was you're going to be this big badass. Everybody was like, you got to be, you know, you muscular. You can be this yeah. badass guy. Yeah. My first movie was a Schwarzenegger movie. You know what I mean? And I was in the sixth day and I was just heavy and the whole thing. But I wanted to be funny. I wanted to be funny. And people were like, hey, man, you can't be muscular and funny. It doesn't work. Like there were so many people who told me that you need to be like this guy and you need to be like that guy and you need to do an action film and all that stuff. And so what I would do is in small roles, I would sneak in comedy and they were like, hey, wait, we're keeping that. Wait a minute, you just, can you do that again? And I, and I remember being on Malibu's Most Wanted and getting this, and I would show, yeah. do things and they were like, wait a minute, you come to the front, you, you, yeah, you, yeah. you. And it was always like that. And I said, man, and I started, and Ice Cube gave me my first shot and Friday after next. Yes. And I was like this comedic heavy, but it was crazy. Uh, and then I got the shot in White Chicks and it just kept going, man. And I was like, and people were like, we've never seen. I had people really, co comedians come up to me and go, hey, man, you broke the rule. Like the rules to be muscular and funny was not possible. Well, it's because none of them can do it. Very few no, comedians yeah, yeah, can on that side. I mean, but that's the thing. It's so like, don't be the best, be the only. And, you know, I, I, Old Spice and all this stuff, man, 10 years of Old Spice commercials, you know, it, it's, it, you, you look back and I was like, man, I just, I love being in this space, man. And it, it, I get an endorphin rush, yeah. just challenging all these, these taboos and things that people say you're not supposed to do and this and that, because I grew up in a world where you weren't supposed to do anything. You know what I mean? That religious thing where it was like, yeah. you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't. It was all can't, can't, can't. And I was like, well, what can we do? You know, and, it, it, and once I started challenging these things and I, I go into it in depth in my book about a lot of the restrictions that were placed on me first as a black man, then as a man, then as a big man and as a muscular man and, and as a sportsman. I mean, it's all these cultures that started to intersect. And they all had preconceived notions of the things I was supposed to do and be. And I said, you know, why? But why? Well, Terry, and I started to challenge it all. Look, look at, I mean, even going back into your history and looking at the Western Michigan University football pictures, man, you would never guess that that, that guy. Now, I've got to ask what your caloric intake was on a daily basis, man. You must have been just eating and lifting and working out. But we would have never guessed that that guy – had such a passion and the actual talent to, to be an artist. You just, let's be honest, people judge books by their cover. I think it's just, it's right. a, it's human nature. And right. though 99% of the time we're often wrong, unless you go back and dive into that person's history to understand why they have the perceptions, perceptions they have based off the experiences which are different than ours. But right. I want to hit two things before we get into uh, to, to the book. You've, and, and actually I think this does pertain to the book because you've shown, one, you've shown an authenticity that we don't always get out of Hollywood actors. And you've, in, in a lot of ways, you've went against the grain, not only with the BLM movement, but the Me Too and breaking the silence. Nobody would have thought that Terry Crews uh, you know, what are you, 6'2", 240, about 235? About, about 235 right now. 235, I'm, 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 I'm you know, always, <laughs> always be careful when you're judging uh, people's weights, especially uh, women. Um, but, I mean, that had to, that took courage. And, uh, I mean, you, you took the brunt end of some criticism. But, as you said earlier, man, there's always going to be people in the stands that that, that criticize you. What what drove you to break your silence for both your perception of how the BLM was being run as well as the Me Too? Well, you know, first of all, um, you know, in regards to BLM, uh, you know, for me, any movement that doesn't begin with reconciliation is a mistake. It's just it's it's just that simple. Um, because if, if we're not talking about recon reconciliation, either through men and women, black and white, Republican, Democrat, what we're doing is postponing a war. And if you take your ball and go home and I take my ball and go home, what happens is you come back with a bat and then you go with, take your bat and go home and you come back with a gun. And these things tend to escalate. They don't Unless reconciliation is the first 
movement, I saw nothing but postponement of a greater war. And I said, wait a minute, man. And this is my analogy for real. You know, it's kind of like you and me. Okay. You have a side of the house and your side of the house has the kitchen and you're like, Hey man, I'm on my kitchen. I'm, I'm good. But I got the side of the house that has the bathroom. And I'm like, well, but but we're good and we got our thing and we don't need you and we don't need you. But sooner or later, I have to eat and I have to use your kitchen. And sooner or later, you're going to have to use the bathroom and you have to get clean and you got to come over to my side. And this is what reconciliation is. It doesn't mean we agree. It means we work things out. We're now, this is where nuance is. It's not, you're the demon and he's the demon and everybody's bad and they're bad. And it's, it's, wait a minute, this is a world. We all have to learn how to live together. And I saw where people were willingly creating segregation. We're willingly saying, nope, we don't need y'all. We don't need it. And I'm like, hey man, I decide that I am going to unify with good people, no matter what race, color, ideology, creed, I am going to unite with good people and I'm going to die on this hill. And I got a lot of flack for that, man. I got a lot of flack. And I mean bad because there were people who were saying that it was antithetical to the movement. And I thought, no, it's not. It's actually because what it needs to be based on. Doing, what you're doing is creating a war. And I didn't want that. And I saw the future. It was, it's like a bird's eye view. You see the end and you're like, so how is this going to end up? You know what I mean? So, and in regards to me too, for me. Let, let me ask oh, you this. Why, yes. why do you think we, we're at a point where there's no civility to have those conversations? Where even say, hey, probably right off, let's agree to disagree. We're probably not going to see, see eye to eye. But let me hear your viewpoint and why you believe what you believe. And let me give you mine and I'll explain why I believe. Why? Why can't we have those conversations? Let me add to this. It's almost like we don't see black, white, uh, yellow, tan anymore. It's like we only see red and blue. Oh, that guy's a Republican or that guy's a Democrat. Right. What What has led us to this point where there's no civility in conversations, in your opinion? And I know that's sort of a, I hope that's not a loaded question, dude. No, it's not. It's, it's not. I think that uh, when you're talking about algorithms that make people argue, you're, you're also talking about the media, the job has become is not to tell the story, but now the media is the story, <laughs> which is crazy. When you look at both Fox News and CNN, uh, both leaders have been kicked out for, uh, for you know, bad behavior. OK, so now they're the story, you know what I mean? And their job is to get you angry and keep you angry. That's the job, and because that creates the algorithm of engagement and engagement means money. And the more you're angry, the more you will engage and the more, the less nuance you have. And you, ca it's the death of nuance where we could actually have a conversation and I could empathize and understand your view. Now you're the enemy and I'm competing with you. And now if once, once it turns into a competition, somebody's got to win. So it becomes, I win today, but I lose tomorrow. It becomes, this, it becomes this game of king of the hill. And so one day they win, one day you win, one day they win. Again, you're, you're, it's a war. And I want to turn it into a conversation. And nuance is necessary. It's really wild because you, once you step back and understand what this stuff is, you're like, wait a minute, I'm being manipulated. I don't want that. And and it, and it's really crazy because it's it's something that happens without you even knowing. And that's the hard part. It takes a lot of introspection. And one thing that I've been really really practicing is how I feel and how what I can control and what I can't. And what I really started to realize is that I was even getting manipulated in the middle of all this where people get you to respond and you feel defensive and this kind of thing. And you just go, wait a minute, why am I even, I, this, this is something that, you know, I wouldn't even, I shouldn't even be involved with, but it, it, you don't know that you're being manipulated. And um, it's just the nature of what this world is right now and social media and the way <laughs> things go. And I'm telling you, man, uh, listen, I, 
I have this, I'm in the media. I, I am a member of the entertainment community. And when it all becomes entertainment, it can be, it can be dangerous because you need real facts. And now no one knows what's real. We, we need more common sense, logical uh, voices uh, such as yours uh, to, to bring that civility back to the conversations and figure this out. And when somebody is uh, king of the hill one day and then uh, the other party is the king, the king of the hill the next, everyone's losing in that scenario. And I think uh, you'd probably agree eye to eye. Uh, it's amazing what we can do when we work as a team regardless if you have different uh, viewpoints. But let's let's dive into this book because one, you know, your your memoirs, the, you know, manhood, how to be a, a better man or just live with one, uh, you got vulnerable. And it sounds yeah. like you said to hell of hell with it, I'm going to get more vulnerable because yeah. I have a message that one, you're, I mean, from what I hear and what I've seen in the book, because I, I got an early uh, copy of the manuscript, which I will not release. Uh, and you you talk a lot about a lot of the obstacles in your life with humility uh, for the good of, of men like us. Give me the guts of why you wrote this book and what you want the readers to take away from it. You know, um, when I went into therapy, um, because I had developed an addiction to pornography, um, and a lot of people, there, surprisingly, there's a lot of people who told me that that's impossible. You know, that's not, it's a figment of your imagination. You, you, you're wired with chemicals. You can't be addicted to pornography. But let me tell you something. When day turned into night and I couldn't stop watching, I had a problem. Like, when I told myself I wasn't going to do it again and I did it again, I said, man, I can't stop. Um, I need I need help. And my wife was about to leave me. Um, and this is another thing why I, I chose to be vulnerable, because this is the mistake. The mistake is that most people feel most men feel like we're alone. You feel like you're the only one. You know, you feel like, man, somebody, they've got it together. Hey, Terry Crews is on TV. He's got it together. But me, oh, I'm a lost cause. This is the truth. And I had to, I, the reason I had to be vulnerable, because then people could read it and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. He, he was in the same spot I am in. You know, first of all, I got to tell you this, man. I mean, all the things I'm talking against right now, I was. Okay, so I would have been the first guy that would have been slamming people and doing all this stuff and talking junk about anybody. And because you can, because, you know, it, 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 it was part of the culture. Like I said, I'm in this intersection of cultures. And when you're talking about, you know, men, we live life as if we were in a revenge movie. OK, it's all about settling the score. You know what I mean? It's about getting back. The fantasy is, man, you call people up and you like, man, I'm going to hunt you down one by one. I'm going to get you. Anybody who ever did me wrong, I'm going to pick them off one at a time. Let me say it's a fantasy that's better than sex with most men. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you can get your get back on anybody who ever wronged you, that is the dream. But the thing is, and this is what I found out, Mike, that you can't have success and revenge at the same time. You, you can have success or you can have revenge, but you can't have both. And I went, what? Most of my life, it was about getting revenge. Dude, I, let me tell you, there's a trail of people who got knocked out by me. I start the book with a guy I put on my head. To put on his head, pow, in the concrete in front of, a, you know, a thousand people on a, on a busy street while everybody was Christmas shopping. And this guy, I felt disrespecting my wife. I picked him up and put him on his head. And the police came and the whole thing. And my wife was like, what are you doing? And I realized I could have lost it all. How many? I can't even count. There are people who've been knocked out by Terry Crews. That's for real. But I had learned this. You're talking about growing up in Flint with the, with the gangs and the drug dealers. And you learn, man, it's kill or be killed. You know what I'm saying? And then you get to the NFL and it's still kill or be killed. You know, and then you get into all these other worlds. And it's like, hey, man, it's either you or me and it's going to be you today. But then I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is a higher way. There's a higher way. There's a way that doesn't make me a statistic. There's a way where I don't have to compete with that. I can get into a whole nother place. And dude, once I found that out, because it's kind of hidden, you feel like there's no mistake. Let me, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. 
as a black man, the the common knowledge is that if anybody calls you nigger, that you knock them out. That's common. That's like bar nut. First off, if somebody calls you a nigga, you knock them out. That is your responsibility. That is what you're supposed to do. And as a man, as a black man, that's what you do. But the deal is, and once I examined that, I said, man, there's no such thing as niggas. I'm not a nigga. So why? Why would I even be offended? Why? And, and what I realized is that that is an example of that person's ignorance. It has nothing to do with who I am. And then it's like calling Bill Gates broke. Like he'd look at you, laugh and get in his helicopter and fly away. You know what I mean? But why? But only if I felt I was actually a nigga would I get offended. And I started to, it started to get really, really deep. And I started to realize there are things that people could use to bait me to pull me in ways I don't want to go, to get me activated, to trigger me, that would trap me. Because you could call me anything and I could swing and I would swing and I would do whatever. And you, the other person controls the situation. And where and when I bring up true power, when I say true power, it's all about controlling yourself, your emotions, your, your feelings, your your physicality, everything about that. You have to learn how to control it. Let me tell you, I haven't had breakfast in 12 years. I do intermittent fast because I tell my body, you eat when I tell you to eat. I have to, I have to train my body to say, wait, I know you're hungry. You're going to get something to eat, but it's when I tell you to do it. And this level of training, this level of, listen, when I, the whole thing about therapy and when I went, my wife left me when, when we did this whole thing and I went to therapy and I discovered, hey, wait a minute, I had to revamp this sex thing as a man because I thought anytime I had a sexual urge, I gotta, I gotta do it. You know, like, hey man, and if you can't, and if, if my woman can't fulfill it for me, I'll find somebody else. But then I had to say, wait a minute, I control my sex drive. I control that. That's no, this Terry Crews is inside of this body. The body is not Terry Crews. So I have to tell it what to do. And you know, I went on a 90 day sex fast with my, my wife was here. She was in, seeing her in the shower and we're in the bed, the whole thing. And I went, psh, no sex. And I realized something because what happened was I loved her more than anything. The love grew. It was like we were 12 years old again. You know, when you know we were 12 and you got a crush on a girl and you hand her a flower or something, or somebody you love, it ain't sex, they got nothing to do with it. Yes. You know what I mean? That kind of purity, we went back. And now I tell my body when you can have sex and when you can't, what you can look at and what you can't. Whereas before I... It was like being led around by your dog. You take your dog for a walk and the dog's walking you. I went, I had to grab the collar and say, hey, 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 uh-uh, you listen to me now. And dude, it changed my life, but it took a while. It took time and it took toughness. It took, wow, It's it took 12 years to get to this spot. And I had to be vulnerable because I had to tell people where I was to show people how far I went, you know? And it's so eye-opening. And even, even now, every day, I'm so thankful, man, because I almost lost it all, Mike. You know, I, am, I was one outburst away from losing it all. And I do want to bring up the whole Academy Awards thing because there was a day I was Will Smith. You could say anything to me and I'd jump up and that was it, you know? But the day I became Chris Rock, the day I learned how to hold it all together. Cause see, some people think toughness is about giving punches, but a lot of times it's about taking them. It's about being able, to, it's about endurance. It's about the will. It's about, wait a minute. You know what? Don't let people control your day. It's up to you. And dude, I just, it's something that I really, it's the message of the book. It's the message that, you know, you have more power than you than you realize 
Um, a lot of us feel like we're powerless to our own bodies, to our own selves. But it takes training and you can do it. You can. It's amazing. Discipline, namely self-discipline, is yes. an attribute that can be grown. And it sounds like yes. you've learned that over your, your, your life as you've matured um, and, and something that we're all working on. And I know self-discipline is a attribute across the nation that is is in a deficit right now amongst men, especially with the obesity sort of, uh, you know, statistics in the United States as it comes down to discipline. And you said it with intermittent fasting. Well, Terry, I know your time is, uh, is valuable. And I do want to tell the, uh, the listeners where they can pick up uh, tough. But before we do, we have a little tradition here. It's sort of a mad minute. We ask two <laughs> questions. First okay. one is, how is Terry Crews going to measure if he lived life well? Ooh, wow. Yeah, it's a stumper, man. I'm going to tell you this right now. By how many people I've served. Let me tell you, that's, that's the only metric that I go off. Um, I am um, to be a leader. You have to serve the most people. I am servant of the most people for me to be considered a dad and a husband. I have to serve my family. You know what I mean? That's a whole different mindset than owning your family, which is the, which is what I used to do. And once I flipped into the mode of, I am your servant. Like wherever you want to go, whatever your goal is, it is my job to help you get there. From my, from my daughters, to my son, to my wife, what do you want in life? It is Terry Cruz's mission to make sure you get there and do everything in my power that you get what you want. Dude, it, and let me tell you, joy comes from that. Happiness comes from that. Being a man, you like, wow. Let me tell you, my son is on TV now. He's living his dream. And I could honestly say, man, you know, we did everything we could do, me and my wife together, to make sure he gets that. And that's true happiness. Like, it's better than if I got it. You know what I'm saying? To see your kids get something, but also your friends, also the people who are your fans, people who, I mean, when I go on AGT and you see people who are just like, oh, I love that show. I love what you do. Dude, that's my mission, like serving the most people worldwide. And that's the metric. That's the measure of true success for me. You guys heard it. Impact. I've always said impact is the greatest currency in life, not money. Uh, because, you know, there's an old story about Alexander the Great. Terry, if you ever heard it, basically, and in, in, I'm paraphrasing, he said, bury, my hand, uh, bury me with my hands outside my grave to show that I came into the world with nothing and that I left with nothing other than the impact and the legacy that you uh, you leave behind. So, um, oh, that's first good. Off, I'm putting that on a poster, man. There I you get go. A with that. <laughs> Trademark that. Um, that's great. So, Terry, Tough comes out on April 26th. Yes, sir. Amazon, is that the best way to get it, to pick it up? Amazon, you can pre-order it now on all my social medias, from Instagram to Facebook to Twitter. I have a link that you can go on. And, and Amazon is probably the best way to get it, but it is available in Barnes & Noble, and any of your local bookstores, but Amazon is probably the quickest way that it'll be in your house right away. You know what I mean? If you would like to get it. Thank I, you. I, so I've already ordered one, folks. Uh, I, I did see the manuscript. You know, man or woman, pick this up. Uh, you are a remarkable. Well, one, it is remarkable when somebody of your stature can open up their life to, 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 to people. And, and again, vulnerability is one of the most masculine traits there is. I don't know That's why it. it's the old culture, you know, hell fathers had to hold back from telling us that, that, that they loved us. Things have changed and it's not a, a gauge of how tough you are by, by holding that in. Uh, Terry, one, one last thing for our listeners, what do you have coming down the pipe, man? What's the next project for you? Or can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been doing, uh, you know, I love doing America's Got Talent, which is awesome. But I'm also in a anthology series, Tales of the Walking Dead. Uh, I can't wait for you guys to see this. It's from the creators of The Walking Dead. And uh, I am introduced into that world. I love, love, love. I just can't wait for people to see it. Um, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Wow. Is there a date or a timeline on that? Oh, this summer. It'll be out this, this summer. summer. 
this okay. summer. Um, so, and I got some a few surprises that I cannot talk about. That once it happens, I can do it. But it's big, like big stuff, man. I'm just, hey, man, I'm living what I call free play land. You know what I mean? It's like I'm living. I'm doing more than I could ever ask or think. I mean, from designing furniture to, you know, live just doing all this writing books and art and just whole thing and acting. I mean, we just finished eight seasons on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I'm just so proud of just, I mean, who gets that? Who gets that? That's This is where I'm, I am the most grateful man in Hollywood. It's impossible to separate me from the gratitude that I have. And I'm thankful to, to be here and to be able to, to talk to you and, and to be able to share my life with men and let them know they're not alone. And, um, you know, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. You're my brothers. Terry, we cannot thank you enough. Uh, from behalf of uh, Men's Journal and the Everyday Warrior Podcast, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to have to get that book, book for, signed uh, by you somehow, some way. So I'll, I'll be I on the hunt. I right. got you. <laughs> well, folks, that's it. Terry Cruz. Thank you, Mike. We'll be back next time.